Well, sometimes there can be a fine line. I think at the end of the day, there is a difference between borrowing elements from something or taking inspiration from something and just ripping it off. Ultimately, whenever you're writing fiction, you're going to be heavily influenced by things that you've read or things that you've watched. Maybe you say, I like that plot twist. I like how they did this. I kind of want to incorporate something like that. I like that particular line. Uh, but also the inverse, where I don't want to do that cliche, or that's just poorly done, or I might have done that, but now I know how to avoid it. And the question is not so much what you're drawing from, it's does your work stand on its own? Is at the core, it's something that's good or at least passable, and it's enhanced by borrowing from other things? Also, it depends what, what you're borrowing, whether it's appropriate to borrow from something, and you put your own spin on it. Do you just copy-paste, or do you actually put in the effort to properly adapt it? And I think the Black Phone is a really good example of something that borrows from other similar horror movies, but does it in its own way. And I wouldn't say it's really a rip-off of any of the films that it borrows from, but it, it does definitely, in my opinion, take a lot of particularly the cinematography uh, the movies that it reminded me a lot of were Don't Breathe, uh, It Follows, the third season of True Detective, and obviously Sinister because it's the same director. I, I also felt there was a little bit of a Netflix crime documentary feel to it. And so basically, it, it, at least it chose to borrow from good material. It borrowed from some of the better horror movies of the past decade or two. And True Detective Season 3, I thought, was pretty good up until the ending, which was a bit of a mess. But, yeah, at least if it was going to borrow from something, I borrowed from that stuff. And I think the movie does very much stand on its own. And even if you haven't seen any of those and can't kind of appreciate the homages, uh, it's a very solid film. In particular, the uh, Mason Thames, the main kid child actor, I thought did a very good job for a child actor. Ethan Hawke did a really good job. I don't think that's really the role he normally does, but he did a good job. He was he was creepy. And overall, I'd probably give this movie a 8 out of 10. Now, keep in mind when I say that, I generally, my scale is 10 is like perfect, amazing, best movie ever. 9 is excellent. 8 is very good. 7's good six is okay, and five is mediocre. So when I say eight, it's actually really high. Um, definitely one of the better horror movies I've seen in quite some time. So that being said, let's get into this movie. So this movie takes place in, I believe it's North Denver. So it takes place in Colorado. So already I'll give it credit for kind of, I can't think of too many movies that are set in Colorado. I think True Detective season three was set in there or somewhere in the Southwest. But I'll give it credit for doing something a little bit different, and it's set in the 1970s. And once again, that kind of gives it an uh, interesting vibe. So in the Denver suburbs, we have this child abductor they call the Grabber, who's gradually taking kids away. And this film is supposed to be supernatural, but I think it's a little bit ambiguous, particularly once we get into the black phone. It's never suggested in the movie, but I can't help but wonder if maybe the phone calls he's getting are his imagination or his subconscious or something. And maybe the visions that Gwen's getting are something subconscious or, or like that. But it's fine if you think it's supernatural. It's fine if you think you don't. And so we have Finney, who's our main character, and Gwen, who's his younger sister, and Finney is kind of a bit of a loser. He gets beat up a lot. Um, there's a lot of fights that happen. There's this one Hispanic kid who's his best friend who protects him. Like when the kids try to beat him up and call him an F slur and stuff, he beats them up too. And he, he tells Finney, someday you've got to stand up to yourself. I see like the inner strength in you. And one day it's going to come out. And it's kind of nice that they set this theme up early in the film. And you do see a lot of development of Finney as the movie goes on. And he does get progressively tougher and more cunning and does kind of start to fulfill his true potential. 
So I like that. That's really good. Um, Gwen has his younger sister has psychic dreams, but in a based move for this film, they're attributed to Jesus. I don't think her father really likes Christianity for some reason, but she has like a crucifix and prayer cards and stuff hidden in her dollhouse. And she frequently throughout the movie prays to Jesus to send her um, visions so that she can successfully catch the grabber. So the grabber goes around in a black van with black balloons and lures kids into it. Uh, he then locks them in a basement and eventually kills them. We're introduced to a couple of kids near the beginning of the film who all get abducted by the grabber. And then, of course, Finney gets abducted by the grabber and gets put into a basement. Actually, that reminds me, the other film this film kind of reminds me of is Split, which, once again, you're at least picking a good movie if you're going to take elements from. So he gets locked in a soundproof basement with like a vault door. And it's kind of interesting because there's a lot of weird stuff in the basement. There's a toilet. There's these rolled up carpets. Uh, there's all this. There's this black phone that's sitting on a wall that's not connected to anything. And when the grabber first comes in to talk to him, uh, Finney's trying to talk into the phone. And the grabber gets really angry about it. It's like, don't use that phone, put it back, it doesn't connect to anything. And the grabber gives him some food, and Ethan Hawke is genuinely really creepy in this role. He does a good job of, like, the pretending that he's your friend to try to gaslight Finney, uh, and stuff like that. Pretty early on, though, uh, Finney realizes uh, that the phone keeps ringing, and all he's getting is static and that kind of thing. Eventually what winds up happening is the grabber leaves him there uh, and doesn't lock the door. And then the phone rings and it's the, the ghost or psychic or reaching out from the afterlife of one of the previous kids who was killed. Telling him that the grabber is waiting upstairs and it's, it's a trap. He's gaslighting him into thinking that uh, he has a chance of escape. And he's going to beat him up and then move on to the next phase of his killing ritual as soon as he goes upstairs. So they tell him just don't go upstairs and he won't know what to do because in his psychotic mind, he's just used to this particular series of rituals. And as we're going through this, the police are trying to catch the grabber. Uh, Gwen's having dreams. It's kind of the B plot. It's not the best, but it's, it's definitely okay. I do appreciate her efforts to try to find her brother. And the scenes where she talks to Jesus are pretty based. So I'll give it credit. And as the movie progresses, uh, Finney keeps getting calls from uh, the various previous victims. And they all try to kind of give him escape plans. So one of them says that there's dirt uh, at one point in the, um, the basement. And he can dig his way out using that, and he can flush the stuff down his toilet. And he tries that, but I, I think he just doesn't get far enough uh, to really be able to tunnel out. Uh, there's also a window in the basement, and someone leaves behind, I think it's a rope or a shoelace or something, and he's able to go and pull the bars off the window, but the window's too high up, and there's no real way that he can reach the window proper. And then there's like some other things that come up where there is a weak wall that he's able to break into and it leads to the back of a uh, freezer. However, he can't open the doors at the front of the freezer. And there's a lot of Chekhov's gun elements to this that you don't really realize because all the different things that are being set up throughout the film are going to pay off later on. And there's just kind of failed escape attempt after failed escape attempt. And eventually one of them tells him that the grabber doesn't know what to do. And he's just been sitting upstairs for hours and hours and hours all night waiting for Finney to try to escape. And he's fallen asleep. And then we get kind of a very much a, a don't breathe call out where Finney goes up. Um, he... Sees the grabber sleeping there. Now, he probably could have maybe taken a kitchen knife and tried to kill him. Uh, he didn't want to do that for some reason. Uh, maybe just because he thought it was too big a risk to be that close to him. The grabber has a 
lock on the front door. It's a bike lock he took from one of the previous kids. And one of the previous kids who calls him had it written in numbers on the uh, the uh, wall. What the, the combination lock was for it. So he succeeds in escaping for a minute or two. The grabber wakes up because of his dog and takes him back to the basement. Meanwhile, Gwen has a dream of a house, and she leads the police there. However, it turns out that it's not actually the house uh, that the grabber's in. It's where the kids are buried. But the police seem to be kind of on his trail, and they'll probably catch him soon. However, he's going to kill Finney pretty uh, around the same time. Now, there was kind of another Chekhov's gun scene where the police are canvassing the neighborhood, and they come across a crackhead who has, like, one of those boards with all the pins in it, and he's been trying to figure out where the grabber is. And there's kind of a funny, oh, shit thing, where he's, like, looking at the map again, and he's like, wait a minute, according to um, the map, my brother is the killer. The house that I'm staying at is actually where the grabber is. So our climax is he goes downstairs. He's like, look, Finny, I didn't know you were here. I'm going to let you out. We're going to go to the police. We're going to take down my brother together. And then Ethan Hawke comes in and just like, I think he cuts his head open with an ax or something like that. And sorry, I, I, I missed something. So before that, he gets a call from the last kid to be there, uh, his best friend. And his best friend tells him, look, you're strong, you're a survivor, it's time for you to finally come into your own and kind of complete your hero's journey. You have to take the phone off the wall, you have to fill it up with dirt, and you have to bash this asshole's head in with the black phone. Once again, it's this film has a lot of good setup that always pays off. Uh, there's a bit of a red herring in that I feel like it was initially kind of implying that the father was involved in the deaths or he was the killer or something like that. But anyway, so the grabber comes down, he brings his dog with him, who he chains up to block the door. And he's just like, look, I'm going to make you suffer now. You're going to die slowly. So we kind of have this cool thing where he combines all the stuff that he previously did in the movie, where he runs uh, past the hole that he's made in the floor and he uses the um, string that he used earlier on to pull down the grate. And he, like, pulls it out, and then the grabber trips over it, and he falls into the hole in the floor. And I think he gets his leg caught on the, um, the grate so he can't get out. And then Finney just beats the shit out of him with his, um, with the uh, phone. And the grabber manages to get him, and he strangles him to death with the phone cord. Once again, we, we have everything previously uh, pay off. After he kills the grabber, though, the dog's still there. But he has the stakes that fell out of the back of the fridge when he managed to get that open, and he uses those to distract the dog and get out. We then find out that the house the police are at is actually the house across the street, and they're able to... Uh, take him in, uh, get him whatever the medical treatment he needs is, and the case of the grabber is solved. He then goes back to school at the end, and he has a swagger, and everyone respects him because he killed a serial killer. And I mean, that if that doesn't make you a badass, I don't know what does. Overall, like I said, though, very solid horror movie. Narrative is very tight. There's not a lot that you can really cut. I don't think the Gwen part is particularly great. But I, I get that they have to have a B-plot to break it up a little bit. It's a very, very tense movie. You don't know when the grabber is going to come back. You don't know when uh, Finney's going to get out, that kind of thing. I would really recommend this film if you like horror movies or suspense movies or thrillers or I guess even crime movies. Uh, excellent film. Definitely go see it. It gets the Argent seal of approval. God bless, guys, and I'll talk to you again real soon.